Welcome to First Congregational Church of Los Angeles, here in the beautiful sanctuary and online around the world. For today's program, I decided to feature female composers to honor, appreciate, and show solidarity with women around the world. This being Mother's Day and with my own mom faithfully being online, I'm definitely thinking about mothers, but I'm also thinking about non-mothers and how much beauty they bring into the world. I'd like to send some love to all of them through music. I will also improvise on this music, sharing it through my own prism. Elizabeth Krauss holds degrees from Corpus Christi State University, the University of Colorado at Boulder, and the University of Missouri at Kansas City. She is organist at Christ Reformed United Church of Christ in Middletown, Maryland, and a freelance recitalist. Lynn Peterson went to Dr. Martin Luther College, Concordia College in River Forest, and the University of Minnesota. She is professor of music at Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Marie Josef Erb lived from 1858 in, to 1944 in Alsace, Elsass, between Germany and France. She studied with Vidor, Saint-Saëns, and Liszt. A composer of numerous piano pieces, she taught at Strasbourg Conservatory and was organist at Johanneskirche. Carolyn Sternowski studied at University of Dayton in Ohio. She is organist at St. Joseph Catholic Church in Marion, Iowa. Clara Schumann was a 20th century German acclaimed concert pianist composer, and piano teacher. She married the composer Robert Schumann, and they had eight children. Fanny Mendelssohn was a German composer and pianist of the early Romantic era. Felix Mendelssohn was her younger brother. Fanny married the artist Wilhelm Hensel, with whom she had one child, Sebastian Hensel. Luisa Adolfa Lebo was born in 1850 in Rastatt and died in 1927 in Baden-Baden. She was a student of Clara Schumann and Josef Gabriel Reinberger. She was a pianist, teacher, critic, and composer. If you would like to visit First Church LA in the future, please go to fccla.org forward slash visit for more information. On the same website, you can find information about our music program and the great organs by going to forward slash music. If you would like to support and underwrite future musical events like we just had last week, please go to forward slash give. Thank you for being here in person and online.
Good morning and welcome to First Congregational Church of Los Angeles. In this place, we are all welcome and free to be who we are, to love who we love, and to search for our faith at our own pace. This morning, we continue our Eastertide series, The Stories We Tell, Banned Books Then and Now. Over these next weeks, we are exploring stories that will open our minds to the diversity of our shared life in this sacred time and place. Together, we'll explore some of the banned books that didn't make the cut in the first centuries of Christianity, along with some of the books that are being banned today. One of the greatest treasures of faith exploration at First Church is finding our places in the never-ending story of the divine. This is a lifelong quest and a quest that is worthy of our time. Listen now to these words of gathering. On this day, we affirm that we see and experience the incredible life in our midst. It, it invites, invites other, other life in us. us. It, it gives, gives life to people, people beyond us. us. We affirm that here in this sacred space, life can be sustained, and that in us new life, life can, can emerge and, and grow, and, and that, that hope for life is, is to be cherished every, every day. day. We celebrate the God who conquered death. We hold ourselves open to a new creation in us. And, and we, we believe that, that in every child of God, God the, Spirit the Spirit breathes a thousand gracious possibilities. possibilities. On this day, may we embrace this life which flows around us, among us, and within us. May it be so. May it, may be, it be so, so for all, all of us. us. Please stand in body or in spirit for our processional hymn.
Let us pray. As we gather this morning, we wait on your word, holy God, in these words of others who have walked with you and now share their story with us on mountaintops of aspiration and low valleys of despair. They have sensed a presence that they had no words to describe, yet they used these journeys to reach for a truth that was beyond them. Today, may we hear all you would have us to hear in their words, in our words, and in your words. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen. Our holy scriptures tell us that we are all created in the image and likeness of God. In this place, we celebrate the mystery of who God is, and we remember that our tradition is rich in calling the divine by many names. Holy One, Adonai, Amma, Abba, Loving Mother, Compassionate Father, Source of Life, Redeemer, Loving Presence. Because of this mystery, we invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer in your own tradition and language. For in this way, we celebrate the interconnectedness of our lives, whether we come from near or from far. Let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Out of the beautiful darkness and the luminous light we came through birth to life with the spirit of God within us from the life of God the universe unfolded into being with the spirit of God within it from the heart of God creation goes on until the end of time with the spirit of God within it and with our spirits within it in this time of worship Let us embrace the God who unfolds us and all of creation. This morning, may the life and peace of God be with you all. 
And we now invite you to share the peace of God to those around you with a bow. And I'd like to now invite our children and youth forward for our children's conversation. Okay, so I'm gonna say good morning, and then that'll be an invitation for all who feel like it to also say good morning in return. All right? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's so awesome. Okay, I love it every time. All right, so to, we are talking about this series in Eastertide of banned books, right? We've talked about certain books that were banned because people didn't like the ideas in them, or they thought they were too dangerous, or it made them kind of feel uncomfortable. And so I have a book this morning that I, to be totally honest, I was shocked was a banned book. If you can look at this cover here and look at the title, what do you think this book is about? Yeah. Babies. babies. Okay, it's literally called Everywhere Babies, and all of these are pictures of babies, right? Okay, so I'm just going to turn to a random page in here, and... What do you guys see pictures of? Babies. babies. All right, yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot of babies in here, okay? And then what about on this page? What do you guys see? Babies. We see some more babies, right, okay. <laughs> there's lots of babies, and there's different kinds of babies, right? And also, you might notice there's different kinds of families in here, right? I mean, you might see here, there's two moms in this family, or maybe these are some grandparents. Um, we don't really know. I mean, if you look at this, look at all these different kinds of families, right? You have maybe single dads or single moms. Maybe some people here are adopted or are in foster care. We don't really know the stories of these babies, right? Or the stories of these families. But there's just a lot of different ways to be a family. And so you might think, okay, well, <laughs> this is a book about babies and a book about families. This is all about the different kinds of people that love babies. What could possibly be wrong with this book, right? Well, here's the thing. So when you are really little and you're growing up, you tend to think that how your family is is how everybody else's family is, right? But as you get older, you learn there's all these different ways of being a family. And some people, they start to think that their way of being a family is the best way of being a family, and those other ways are like, not so great ways of being a family to the point where some people got so upset they were like we cannot be showing a book where there's all these different ways of being a family because they need to know the best and only way of being a family is my way right which is not really great but the thing is is not all families are a safe and loving place that's also true in fact some people families where they live at home can feel scary or it can feel dangerous sometimes and so that's why it's really great that we also have this church family here so that when you have times at home, maybe when you're having some hard times with your parents or you're having some hard times with school, you can look out at these people and you can lean on them too. So it's kind of like you get a bonus family. You have your home family and you have your church family. So we have a lot to be grateful for. So let's do a prayer together before we head to First Kids First. And everyone, I invite you to pray with me, and you can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for families. Thank you for big families. Thank you for small families. Thank you for church families. In your name we pray.
Amen. And with that, we'll head down the center aisle. Listen to these familiar words from, excuse me, from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20. Mary of Magdala stood weeping beside the tomb, and even as she wept, she stooped to peek inside. And there she saw two angels in dazzling robes. One was seated at the head and the other at the foot of the place where Jesus' body had lain. They asked Mary, Why are you weeping? Mary answered them, Because they have taken away my rabbi, and I do not know where they have put the body. No sooner had she said this than she turned around and caught sight of Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus asked her, Why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Mary supposed that it was the gardener and said, Please, if you are the one who carried Jesus away, tell me where you've laid the body, and I will take it away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to Jesus and said, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus then said, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to Abba God. Rather, go to my friends and tell them, I'm ascending to my Abba God and to your Abba, my God, and your God. Mary of Magdala went to the disciples. I have seen the teacher, she announced. Then she reported what the Savior said to her. This is the gospel of grace. Thanks be to God. In the midst of a heavy week in the life of our country and world, we come to this time of silence and prayer, expectantly awaiting the voice of wisdom, of hope, of peace. Our prayer following this silence will include additional times of silence, each of which Dr. Bull will begin with chimes, reminders to breathe deeply again, that we would be renewed in body, mind, and spirit in these moments, that we might be strengthened in our work of renewal in the world. Let us enter this silence together.
spirit of life, you move in and through us like breath. When our circumstances feel suffocating, you draw us back into the rhythms of life that were before us and will be beyond us. Rhythms that are slow. Rhythms that accept times of death and times of rebirth. Rhythms that persevere but don't force. Rhythms that embrace change. Rhythms that encourage every individual in the direction of the whole's well-being. Together, every creature in creation yearning for life. Every blade of growing grass breaking through soil, reaching for the full light of the sun. Every mother bear watching over her cubs day and night, protecting vulnerable life. Every saint refusing to compromise on the dignity of your people in fleshing radical love. When our schedules and our machines and our media and our words make us forget that we are creatures among creation, vulnerable flesh, beloved parts of a whole, may we find you again in our inhales and our exhales, pacing our breath with the spirit of life that has always been pulsing through creation connecting everything that is across millennia. In our striving for life, we are not the first and we will not be the last. May our beating hearts and every rise and fall of our lungs remind us we are never alone, not for a single breath. Amen and amen.
Beautiful prayer, Reverend Michael. Beautiful music. Thank you so much. So this morning, we're going to talk about the non-canonical gospel of Mary, The Handmaid's Tale, and It's Mother's Day. Whose brilliant idea was this? I don't know if it was Michael or I, but I'm saying it's all him today. <laughs> when Michael laid out the plan for Eastertide this spring, we were all in agreement. This was the time for a series on banned books. While banning books is not a new phenomenon and has been with us literally for centuries, it has made a stunning comeback in recent years. School boards, libraries, local, state, and national governments, everyone's getting into these discussions that have become quite acrimonious. Religion has been front and center in many of these fights. The long history of the church has been filled with banned books since soon after its beginning. Early on, as the stories of the Jesus movement began to be written, the debate over which books were acceptable and which books were not approved for a wider audience became a point of contention. Some books were lost, some books were banned, some books were made illegal, especially in the Roman Empire as it confiscated Christianity. James Bean reminds us there is a very long list of hidden, banned, forbidden, censored, condemned, cursed, and even burned books that were once considered holy scriptures. The Gospel of Mary is one of the books that disappeared for over 1,500 years. Believed to have been written in the second century CE, a small fragmentary copy was found in the 19th century. While additional fragments in Greek were found in the 20th century, no copies of the entire Gospel have ever been found it is probably lost to us forever. So we have then a non-canonical gospel, which as Michael told you at the beginning today means it didn't make the cut. It was not included in the year of our Lord 692 when the decisions about which books were in and which books were out was made. We might ask then, why should we care about this gospel and others like it? Why should we care about stories we have to struggle to read, much less understand? Why should any of these hidden, banned, forbidden, censored, condemned, cursed, and even burned books enter in dis into discussions in our time and place? The answer is rather simple. When we bury the multitude of voices contained in these books, we are left with only part of the story. The dominant stories and narratives that we know as historical fact have been written by the powerful. When we disregard the stories of those who were suppressed, we cede our power to those in control. And in essence, we deem the stories from the margins as illegitimate. Our gospel reading this morning is one of the few passages about Mary of Magdala found in the New Testament. Even though her appearances in the gospels are rather brief, if we have been in any kind of church somewhere in our lifetime or seen Jesus Christ Superstar or the Da Vinci Code eons ago, we believe we know who she is. One of the central elements of Mary Magdalene's story center around her being a prostitute. Yet what is now known is that this popularized, centuries-long characterization of her is not found in Scripture. The discovery of several earlier manuscripts has provided a broader picture in which Mary Magdalene is unexpectedly prominent. She was a leader, a prophet, a mystic. She was praised and loved by Jesus and... She was in conflict often with the other disciples. There is a feeling among many that the church covered up this Mary and in doing so betrayed its faithful by suppressing feminine metaphors for God and female leadership 
both past and present. Many feel a reclaiming of Mary Magdalene and her story fulfills the desire, both popular and scholarly, to rethink the norms that have come out of the traditions of the church. By once again hiding, banning, forbidding, censoring, condemning, cursing, and burning books, we have taken away the witness of those whose stories were vital to the narratives that became sacred. While a variety of banned books, especially in religion, bring new light to the past, many of our modern-day banned books attempt to bring light to the future. It is debatable when dystopian literature began to evolve. Some say it was a direct result of utopian literature. So one could argue that it is a fitting description of the beginning of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible and its story of the Garden of Eden. The origins were certainly very early, but it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that dystopian literature found its way into the portion of the modern era we are most familiar with. Dystopian tales imagine the impossible to imagine. Whether it is a civilization destroyed by a nuclear holocaust, zombie hordes, or an alien invasion. I personally can do without the first two, but you know, those alien invasions really are quite interesting. <laughs> and yes, a number of the books that we find on the banned books list are dystopian literature. The current call for the banning of books appears to want us not to look to the past or look to the future. Yet without understanding our past, we cannot authentically live in the present. Without facing trajectories as we are bar barreling forward, we cannot have a future that is bright and beautiful without making some serious repairs. Which brings us to Margaret Atwood's book, The Handmaid's Tale. Earlier this spring, we had no idea that a draft of a ruling regarding a lawsuit around the 1973 Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade would come to light this particular week. Part of me wanted to change our course and only concentrate on the Gospel of Mary this morning. I quickly realized that was a coward's way out. Believe me, there are times I have no trouble taking the safe, cowardly approach. But I knew deep in my heart this was a time when I had to count the cost of what I would say today. To be honest, I had to make myself finish reading The Handmaid's Tale. And try as I may, I have not been able to get through the first season of Hulu's adaptation of Atwood's novel. It isn't because I do not like dystopian literature, but I have had a hard time with this depiction of the future. And while the world Atwood has created seems absolutely unbelievable, the core of her vision of this world does not. We are at least semi-aware of the injustices that women have endured, and yet we keep repeating those old stories. As I began to write this message on Thursday, the news from Monday night was like a cloud hanging over me. Even in the midst of a beautifully and wonderfully busy week, it was a hard week, and I was living somewhere between utopia and dystopia. So by Thursday afternoon, my notes didn't resemble a sermon at all. And even though I didn't call on them, the ancestors showed up. I had forgotten the exact date of Roe v. Wade. But when I saw it was 1973, it brought back a conversation I had with my mother a few days after the decision all those years ago. 
When I came home from school that afternoon, my mother had a snack ready at the kitchen table. I had outgrown snacks after school long before, so I wondered what this all was about. When I saw the tears in her eyes, I was afraid something had happened to my father or to one of my siblings. Before I could ask, my mother began telling me a story I had never heard before and I would never hear again. It was a story about my grandmother's sister, Pearl. My great aunt Pearl was married with two sons and a very successful husband when she died from a botched abortion in 1917. I have no idea if she tried to end the pregnancy herself or if a doctor tried to perform the abortion. What my mother told me is that she carried that baby for several more months before both she and the child died. Pearl was one of 17 children in her family. My great-grandfather was a Baptist preacher who had seven children with his first wife before her death and 10 children with my great-grandmother, Laura. Pearl's life growing up, as all of the siblings would say, was not easy. As my mother told me Pearl's story that afternoon, there was not one ounce of judgment in the retelling. There was only sadness in a renewed memory days after the law of the land changed to prevent such things from happening in my lifetime. In a 2017 essay about The Handmaid's Tale, Atwood described writing Ofred's story in the tradition of the literature of witness. She was referring to those accounts left by people bearing witness to the calamities of history they had experienced firsthand. Wars, atrocities, disasters, social upheavals hinge moments in civilization. It's a genre that includes the diary of Anne Frank, the writings of Viktor Frankl, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn. On that afternoon long ago, my mother, whose middle name was Pearl, gave witness to a story that occurred two years before she was born and 56 years before Roe v. Wade. It had affected her family and it had carried through the generations. She told that story, though, interestingly, with hope. With the hope that that story would never again happen to anyone she loved. Please understand, my mother was a very conservative Christian. She was also a woman who had known the heartache of women who had no choice. Margaret Atwood believes in the importance of agency and strength. She insists it does not require a heroine with the visionary gifts of Joan of Arc or the ninja skills of Katniss Everdeen. There are other ways of defying tyranny, of participating in the resistance, or helping to ensure the truth of the historical record. The very act of writing or recording one's experiences, Atwood argues, is an act of hope. Like messages placed in bottles tossed into the sea, witness testimonies count on someone, somewhere, being there to tell their story to read their words, and to remember. So this week, follow the choir's lead. Read all the books in your library. Find one of the banned books this week. 
hopefully one written by a woman, and read it. On this day, we do remember and we bear witness to the stories as we count the cost for how we will respond in our day and time. Amen. Through the spirit of new life, God has expressed a love grand and generous and affirmed the value of all life in a manner both gracious and bold. As recipients of this love, we are given the opportunity to develop a generosity that is life-changing for us and for all God's children. On this day, we invite you to join us in giving generously for the work of diversity, of inclusion, of welcome, and of justice in this sacred place and in our world.
God of song and silence, God of life and breath, God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, on this day our hearts and minds have been filled with your love and grace and goodness. Help us in the days to come to share these gifts with all who need your love and our care. May it be so. May, May it be so, so for us. all of us. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty overmasked. So this one I wore today, it's the first time I've worn one exactly like this, and it darn near drove me crazy. I won't be wearing it another time. I know we would all like to get rid of these masks. I certainly would. We have had problems uh, with the school. We have had some outbreaks. We have had a lot of things going on. The county of LA is telling us the numbers are rising that we need to be very careful indoors. So we're gonna keep with these masks as much as we hate them for the near time future. Thank you for your patience with them. Thank you for caring about the vulnerable that are in our congregation. So there's information in your program about our annual meeting, which is next Sunday right here in the sanctuary at 1230. We are excited to share with you the dreams and the visions for this next church year, which begins in July. Reverend Michael will be there. Uh, David Harris will be there. Chester McCurry will be there, all sharing about what their plans are and what their hopes and visions are. And then we will also be working with the business of the church, our budget, and what we need to be able to accomplish all of those things that we'll be, we will be sharing with you. The band book series does continue next Sunday as we think about the book To Kill a Mockingbird. Reverend Michael's book conversations will continue on Tuesday evenings online at 7 p.m. You can email him at mlayman at fccla.org to join that group. Some of the things that are happening at First Church in the near future include today at 4 p.m. in the sanctuary, the U.S. International Concert Series, they will have a show that features the multiple Grammy Award winner, Sharon Isbin. Tickets are available for that at uscclassicguitar.org. The Antlers, who none of you seem to know, and I don't know, but they're a big, you do know them now? Oh, good. They're going to be here on May 20th, and I will just about guarantee it will be sold out. And in fact, probably two nights will be sold out, but there may still be tickets available if you'd like to check with one of our promoters and partners, Sid the Cat. They have those tickets. And then in partnership with Book Soup, Selma Blair will be here on May 26th, discussing her book, Mean Baby, a memoir of growing up. Perhaps just as exciting is that Megan Mullally will be here to lead that discussion with Selma. Tickets are available from Book Soup. We are fulfilling our vision for becoming a performing arts center for our city as we strive to bring together spirituality, community, and justice. I was at a concert last Sunday night with the African American Chamber Orchestra of Los Angeles, one of the most beautiful concerts I have ever been to. So I encourage you to look for these concerts and to come and be part of them. And if you're going to be here, let us know, because we love to have people greet and tell people about this beautiful space and invite them back on Sunday mornings. Let's share now these words of blessing. Go into this day in faith, and may each day in the coming weeks be born of God. May each hour be a journey with the Christ. And may each moment be filled with the life and grace of the Spirit. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen.
coffee hour in Mayflower Courtyard to greet First Church community together. And now we invite you to be seated for our postlet. Thank you. 